We are going live. We are live. Claudine is putting her tiara on <laughs> for this fabulous occasion. I love that. It's so pretty. I want a tiara. Well, you know, I mean, for, you know, it's, it's, we're talking about queens and princesses. So <laughs> it's better than just sitting in, sitting in, sitting in bed wearing it, right? I mean, isn't this the problem? We have these things and we never get to wear them except for Halloween. You should I definitely know. be sporting that right now. It's a beautiful tiara. We're talking, it's perfect. It's the princess dye tiara. Mm -hmm. You have the princess time to watch the crown, which I'm super excited about. The new I, I couldn't get into the crown. I was like, this is so boring. Oh, watch it again. Cause I, the first time it came out, I think I watched like the first like few episodes and I kind of stopped watching it. And then I think when the lockdown started, I watched them again. And then I was like obsessed with it. Yeah. Guy, is anybody watching the crown? Thank you guys for joining us. We're talking about French princesses and Queens today, but we were just talking about the queen, you know, the British the British history of the queen. And I just couldn't get through the first episode. I'm like, this is so boring. <laughs> give it another chance. Yeah. I'll give it another chance. I'll just, I'll try to watch like up to the third episode. When does it get interesting? Um, I mean, I think, I think just, yeah, I think third or fourth episode probably, but okay. now the new season's about, um, we'll have princess Diana in it. Oh, that's cool. I like that. I could get yeah. into that. Maybe I'll just skip the other ones. Yeah, which will be interesting because sometimes depending, I saw some show that was on Netflix and it was some series about the Royals and you could, and they gave them like all this access to be able to go through um, documents and stuff of the Queens and cool. which I thought was really interesting until they got to the Princess Diana episode and they basically made her out to be this crazy person who was out to ruin them. And I was like, I am not liking this at all. <laughs> <laughs> We're not watching this. For yeah. you guys who's tuning in, we are talking about the queens and princesses of France. Hello, Ellen. Bonjour. We're so happy to have you here. Bonjour, you Ellen. Us. Was it hard to find us? Was it complicated? Normally, you should get like a little alert on, on Facebook, and the link is always on the fan page as well. Yeah. And Claudine made a uh, an event out of it, so... So many ways to find us, but we are so happy to have you guys here. We are going to give you some trivia. You're going to guess. We love when you guess, even if you maybe have no idea, we want you to guess the answer to these questions because we will give you qu uh, a little bit of a quiz and some trivia on the Queens and princesses of France. And you can see Claudine is wearing her crown, which is perfect. <laughs> Good evening, Corolla. Hey, Joan. You, you, everyone's finding us. Okay, so maybe our links weren't working well. Sorry about that, guys. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. The last week's video. We don't have control of it. Facebook decides that. It's really annoying. Coretta, thank you for coming. We're so happy to have everyone here. Kathy, yeah. yes, thank you for joining us. Oh, thanks, Ellen. <laughs> I mean, she's wearing a crown. She looks like a beautiful princess. We love Claudine. This has been sitting on my table in the kitchen for like a year. <laughs> I love that it was just sitting on a table in your kitchen. Like that's part of your cooking situation. And I wish I could say it was the only one I had. <laughs> Mail one to France so I can wear one too. I yeah, want to I'll bring you one. Claudine. Yeah. But I don't know where the other one is though. Hi, Roxanne. Oh, hey, Rox. Yes. So happy to have everyone here. We're going to ask you guys some questions about the queens and princesses of France and just throw out some answers. I mean, maybe you have no idea. Just guess. It's supposed to be fun. Um, and Claudine, are you going to give us a little background on some of the people we're talking about? Or are you just. Well, it's gonna... a whole mixed bag. So yeah. it's kind of a whole bunch. It's uh, queens and empresses. So it's anywhere from, you know, Marie Antoinette that you might know to Josephine to some of them you might not know. Yeah, we're going to teach you. I mean, just throw some guesses, but you're also going to learn something tonight. Cheryl, thank you for coming. Bonjour. Hey, Cheryl. We're so happy to have all you lovely people here. We're looking for Dawn. Where's Dawn? You know, Dawn. I know. Where's Dawn and Carol? Dawn and Carol, we need you. All right, guys. I am going to ask the first question, and then Claudine is going to give us the answer, and she'll give you a little bit of history, but just have fun. And don't feel shy to throw out any answers. No problem. We love hearing from you guys. So our first question about the queens and empresses of France. 
Who built the Val de Grasse in hopes of finally becoming pregnant with an heir? So they built something beautiful and large and expensive so that they could get pregnant. I mean, that's that's what all women are doing these days, right? You know, you just build a castle and, and maybe you get knocked up. That's the goal in life. <laughs> or you go to Père Lachaise and rub on a statue. Or yeah, rub, rub on a you tomb. were in our last uh, trivia. There was a lot of uh, weird things happening in the Père Lachaise to these poor uh, statues. <laughs> Roxanne, I love that you're here for the education. It's fine if you don't know the answers. I don't know the answers either. Claudia <laughs> is teaching me so much. <laughs> I kind of make them sort of hard, but sort of easy. Yeah. In Claudine's world, you know. Marola, I love it. She's given out some guesses. Maureen's given some guesses. Some guesses, mm -hmm. Maureen. Uh, she said Queen Anne and then Anne de Ostrich. I might be saying that wrong. Look at these people. Does anyone ever else have any guesses? These are some good guesses, guys. I love it. Maureen and Carola are throwing some great guesses there. Does anybody else have a guess about who built Val de Grasse in hopes of finally becoming pregnant with an heir? So, you know, we built things. This was before artificial insemination. We just <laughs> built a, a beautiful place to get pregnant. Well, they were having a hard time. Just as expensive, I feel like, if you're oh, trying to get pregnant in the States. Probably. Same thing. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, Corolla is correct. Yes, there, and Maureen is too, because you know she was a queen. Um, yes. Anne Autriche, um, actually, she married Louis the Fourteenth when she was fourteen years old, and Louis the Fourteenth, um, um, while they were they were trying to get. Um, or Louis the 13th. And so she, you know, we're supposed to consummate the marriage. She was 14 years old. He was 15 years old. And, and his mother, Marie de Medicis stood over them in their marital bed on their wedding night. Um, but they didn't consummate the marriage. They went for quite a long time that they, um, she would actually get pregnant and, but she would actually, um, miscarriage and she had quite a few stillbirths. So, you know, the whole role of the woman um, for the queen was to deliver an heir. So she actually decided to build the Val de Grasse and she may said a prayer and said, you know, I will build this abbey and this church if I will hopefully be pregnant with an heir. And so she actually, she had a built and on September 5th, 1638, Louis the 14th was born. Man, that seems like a lot of work to have a baby, but it looks like it worked actually. It's, it's stunning. It's a beautiful church. It's um, very rarely open. You could go on Patrimoine days. It's the third weekend of September, but it's open a few other times during the year. But if you get a chance, definitely go in and see it because it's absolutely stunning inside. Mm, I'm going to go. I always try to avoid the the heritage days or whatever, because there's such crazy long lines, but actually but that's, only, that's really only at like Elysee. There's only a few places that people like Elysee palace and the hotel de Ville. Um, those are the places everybody wants to get into because they're really completely shuttered. But then once you kind of go down the list, most people don't really care. <laughs> I did the, um, the sewers of Paris one year and there was oh. no line there guys. <laughs> no, <laughs> It sounds really disgusting doing the sewers, but it doesn't smell. It's actually fascinating what they did ahead Are of there. Are there rats? There's no rats. Oh, it's actually really interesting down there. There's nothing disgusting down there. You're just underground. You're in a giant cave. Very interesting. Do the sewers of Paris. You can do them any time of the year. There's a museum yeah. right near um, uh, Iena. Iena or, uh, yeah, great place to visit. All right, guys, good guesses. Love it. Corolla and Maureen got that one. And we're going to do the next question. Who said, let them eat cake? I feel and like this is a awesome. trick. There's a trick <laughs> guys let them eat cake who said it any guesses guys come on I'm very adamant about the fact that the person they think said it did not say it so <laughs> i love it i mean we're always team uh a mary correct yeah. <laughs> there was many marries mm -hmm. but who said let them eat cake any guesses guys who do you think said it you know it can be a little a little temptation to say that woman we all know. Nobody said it. Ellen, that's a great guess, actually. Maureen said it. Nobody. Great guesses. Anybody else have a guess about who said let them eat cake? Brioche. Yeah, correct, Cheryl. 
Good job, Cheryl. Was cake even existing back then? Well, I mean, if they, I mean, yeah, I would say yes, but it would have been let them eat gateau. <laughs> yeah, that would be the, the English word. Kathy mm -hmm. says no one. These are a lot of great guesses, guys. I love how smart our group is. Marie Antoinette did not say it. You're correct, Joanne. It warms my heart that everybody knows that she did not say it. <laughs> protect Marie Antoinette. She did not say let them eat cake, guys. Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Corolla, not a bad guess. Anybody else have guesses? Who said, let them eat cake? Any guesses out there? The correct answer, answer is actually Marie Therese. And I'll let Claudine explain that. Yeah, so Corolla is correct with the Jean-Jacques Rousseau. He published a book um, called Confessions. It was an autobiography in 1765. Marie Antoinette was just nine years old, living back in Austria. And so he had written in there, um, his exact thing was, at length, I remember last resort of a great princess who told that the peasants had no bread. She replied, let them eat brioche. And it was stated that it was a Spanish um, princess and so it's, it was actually, it's uh, more likely that it was actually the wife of Louis the 14th, Mary Therese, that actually said, basically, let them eat brioche. Mm, it just doesn't roll off the tongue as well, you know? No. Let them make it so much more fun to say. But it wasn't attributed where people think somebody attributed in a um, newspaper article in the 1800s that it was Marie Antoinette. So it was like some 60, 70 years after she had died that they somebody said that it was Marie Antoinette. Mm, it's funny. Phyllis, thank you for joining us. So hey, now Ellen. you can tell everybody it was not Marie Antoinette. She never said that. Poor Mary, you know, we all know what happened to her. All right, we have some smart people in this group. I love it. Next question, guys. For those of you just tuning in, we're asking trivia questions about the queens and empresses of France. So just throw out a guess. Doesn't matter if you have no idea. I have no idea. Claudine is teaching me so much. All right, the next question. Which of the Medicis was known for poisoning people? So do we know which of the Medicis was known for literally poisoning people? We talk about this woman in the podcast. Has it been really checked, Claudia? I don't think this one. Yep, yep, yeah, we did. That so one is a little while really ago. We've been, we've been recording a lot, guys. We have so much fascinating information coming out for you. So if you listen to the podcast, you will know which of these ladies was poisoning people and she was related to the Medicis. Catherine's here. Hi, Catherine. Thanks for coming. Hey, Catherine. Catherine. Catherine says, Catherine. <laughs> <Girl>. <laughs> Catherine. Good guesses, guys. This Medici was poisoning people. Bad news, guys. I feel like that was happening a lot back then because there was really no like forensic trail. This could be a very easy thing to do. <laughs> True. Well, you the Medici's were known for it. Medici's uh, were known to kill each other off at times, too gain power and take over the banking. And they were originally from Italy, correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Those Medicis. Maureen says Catherine. Kathy says Catherine. You guys are all correct. So smart. They must have all listened to the episode. Yes, it was Catherine. She, um, aside from that, she was also really devoted to astrology. She counted Nostradamus as one of her very close friends and advisors. And so she actually had was known to uh, be involved with more than one plot against some of the women at, at court, including um, Jean Delbert, who was the mother of Henry III, who would become Henry IV, um, when they actually decided that their wedding was going to happen. She ended up uh, uh, basically offing the mother with uh, by getting her a pair of gloves that had poison in them. I like the idea of gloves with poison in them. That's very fascinating to me. That's mm -hmm. a different way of giving the poison. She didn't have to eat anything. Yeah, don't touch your face. Don't put your hands in the gloves and touch your face. <laughs> Bad idea. That was great, guys. Everyone got that one right. Coretta, you got it as well. Next question. Which queen was kidnapped and hidden for years? So this queen, she was French. She was kidnapped and she was hidden away for years and this was a very very early it was a long time ago 
have a podcast on this queen is coming out soon on La Vie Creative, Paris History of Rebecca Hemingway. Oh, yeah, next week. Next week it's coming out, guys. So you're going to learn more about this queen. But she was literally kidnapped and hidden away for years. Somebody pretended to be her, I believe, if mm -hmm. I remember what we recorded. <laughs> Any ideas, guys? Any she's ideas? also a statue in the Jardin de Luxembourg, one of the 20 women. She's one of them. So there's 20 total. Mm -hmm. I never knew exactly how many there were. I didn't count them. Any guesses on which queen was kidnapped and hidden away for years? Corolla says Marie Therese, daughter of Marie Antoinette. Well, that's not very a bad, good guess. Very good guess. Any other guesses for who was kidnapped and hidden away for years? It was a queen. A long, Rose, long, long time ago. Marie Antoinette, not a bad guess either. This is way before Marie Antoinette and Marie Therese as well. One of the first queens to be kidnapped and hidden away. Jennifer says Eleanor. Not a bad guess either. Mm -hmm. Any other guesses, guys? This poor queen. It's bad enough you're being sold off, sold off by your own per parents, you know, to be married mm -hmm. to a French king. But also you were kidnapped. <laughs> so this one, I feel like no one's going to know because it's very <laughs> difficult. <laughs> queen Bert. Which Bert. I Bert. <laughs> I try to find as many people to talk about on the podcast as I can with the name Bert. So you say Bert. <laughs> yeah, Claudine loves to confuse me with that. I just think of Bert and Ernie. It's great. Uh, it, so, yeah, it happened? makes it confusing. What so, happened to her? Queen Bert um, is a pretty amazing story. She was actually born in the year 719. So we're talking a long, long time ago. But uh, she was known um, far and wide for her beauty. And Pepin the Short um, heard about how beautiful she was and wanted to marry her. Marry her. So she was supposed to be on her way up to court. And uh, she was on her way and her cousin and... Um, that's right, Cheryl. Um, she uh, she was on her way to court and he had this dastardly idea because he felt his daughter looked a lot like her and that he could replace um, Bert at court with his daughter. So along the way, they decided to stop off for the night and they tied her up and where they were going to actually kill her. And they um, one of the soldiers actually heard him say he was gonna behead her. So he um, was very nice and decided to, when he had a chance, free her. And she ran into the Le Mans uh, forest and hid. And then um, they they carried on and went to court. Well, Pepin married this, his, basically her cousin, and one day her mom, like a couple of years later, decided she wanted to go to court and see her daughter. So she goes to court and she sees her and says, wait, this isn't this isn't my daughter. And everybody thought she was she was like, yes, it is. You're crazy. This is your daughter. And but she had one very distinct physical feature. And Cheryl is right. She if you could read French, she um, had a club foot and one foot was like much larger than the other foot by like a couple inches. And so her mom went into her bedroom and lifted up the blanket and saw that the woman that was in bed had the same her feet were the same size. And then she told everybody. And then that's when they finally figured out that it wasn't Bert. And they had her cousins um, burned at the stake. But one day Pepin was uh, out hunting in the forest of Le Mans. And he came across this beautiful young girl praying at this little makeshift altar in the middle of the forest. And he started talking to her and he found out it was, it was Bert. I love that she had a giant foot and that <laughs> <laughs> And of course, you know, in your mind you figure, you know, you hear feel like it's a one foot's this big and the other one's like that big. <laughs> but it, it wasn't really. I don't think it was that big. But they found out who she they found out found Bert. Bert, so you make me do it every time. <laughs> and brought her back to court and they lived happily ever after. They fell in love. Cheryl, you knew it. Exactly. It should be oh, grand Piet. She only had one big foot. Yeah. But she would also go on to become the mother of her. She, her first child she had was named Charles. He would go on to become Charlemagne. I love that part of the story. It's, mm -hmm. it's very, it's all connected. It's all it connected is. in history. Mm -hmm. All right. Good job, Cheryl. Next question, guys. This woman was named queen of another country at just six days old. Okay. So she was six days old. She was just born. Mm -hmm. 
and they've already named her queen of another country. I mean, mm -hmm. was there any limit on age? Like you? No. Uh, well, I mean, there was to serve, you know, to actually take the throne. Um, but her her father had died when she was six days old. Mm. And he was a king of another country. Interesting. So she was the queen. Her father passed away. She was only six days old. And she is the queen. They can't actually serve until they're what? They're usually 13. 13. 13 sounds terrifying to have someone in charge of anything. <laughs> <laughs> Could you imagine a 13 year old? I mean, I think that would be my nephew right now. I think he's 14 and I can't imagine him ruling a country. I can't imagine myself as a 13 year old ruling. He's a great kid, but I can't. I mean, that would be difficult. The brain is not fully formed, guys. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. So Catherine says, Mary, Queen of Scots. Phyllis says, Mary, Queen of Scots. Corolla says, Mary Stewart. And Kathy says, Mary, Queen of Scots. All good guesses, guys. Anybody else have a guess about who was the queen when they were just six days old? That is terrifying. I actually have to go with Mary Stewart. Yeah, Mary Queen of Scots, it's the same. See, uh, Mary Queen of Scots in 1542 is just six days old. Her father, James V of Scotland, died. Um, her mother obviously stepped in and served as regent. And when Mary was just five years old, she was betrothed to Francis II, who was the son of Henry II and uh, Catherine de Medici. And she was actually shipped off to France to be educated over in France alongside Francis. Um, they had a whole, uh, there, they had a very, um, close friendship as children and they got married and, but their, uh, reign of France was very short lived and everybody kind of knows the story of Mary and she goes back to Scotland and her cousin, Elizabeth, the first, the Virgin queen of, of, uh, England didn't like her so much imprisoned her, chopped off her head. So that's the abridged version. <laughs> No happy endings there, guys. No, no. <laughs> Yikes. Good guesses, guys. Everybody got that right. So good. All right. Next question. Who built a palace and a garden to remind her of her Florence childhood? So this, this person, this queen or empress, was missing Florence. So she built a palace and a garden to remind her of her childhood in Florence. Any guesses, guys? Catherine so loved the period. reigning period. Yes, so many things happened. <laughs> Corolla says, Marie de Medici. Anybody else have a guess? We got some good guessers tonight, guys. She was missing Florence, so she went and built a palace and a garden, as one does, you know, natural mm -hmm. order of things. Sandra says the same thing. Maureen says the same thing. Good guessers, guys. You are all correct. It was, of course, Marie de Medici. Um, in 1611, she purchased the small, um, small property that was owned by Francois Luxembourg, the Duc de, Duc de Pigny, and she bought his small um, Hotel Particulaire, which is now known as the Petit Luxembourg, which is right next to, if you're walking down Rue de um, Zivogar, well, if you're walking down there to the right of the palace, um, it's really adorable. Um, but she ended up purchasing that because it was, right, it was after, uh, about a year after, um, Henry IV was died, was killed and died. And so she wanted something that reminded her of Florence. So she even sent French architects back to Italy to study, um, to go to Florence to study the Petit Palais or the um, Petit Palais and uh, come back to France to build her this amazing, wonderful palace that we all love today. Then it was, of course, the Palais de Médicis, but now we know as the Palais de Luxembourg, which is the seat of the Senate but it's in the middle of that garden that everybody loves. Um, she, it was constructed, it began to in 1615. She only stayed there a very short time because her son, uh, Louis the 13th, kept exiling her and sending her away. And so she didn't, she didn't even get to see it finished. That's really sad. That whole drama with her son. We talk about that in the podcast as yeah. well. Lots of drama. Mm -hmm. Oh, you took Catherine there, Claudine. I did take Catherine there. I love it. The tour. Claudine take, gives tours, guys. So when the borders are open, hire Claudine to give you a tour of Paris. She's amazing. 
So who was the secret queen and wife of Louis the 14th? So we all know kings, they all had mistresses and people they'd rather have spent their lives with that their parents didn't decide for them. But do we know who the secret queen and wife of Louis the 14th was? Any guesses, guys? We talk about her in the podcast as well. We do. That one comes up the, comes at the end of December. So she was the secret queen and secret wife of Louis the 14th. Do we know of any kings who did not have a mistress? I mean... Louis the Sixteenth. No, Mr. I mean, he had a hard time with his own wife. So <laughs> Louis the Sixteenth didn't. He didn't have to pick up any other ladies because he was having a hard time providing for his wife. <laughs> yeah, he was busy playing with his keys and his locks. Wasn't there a lot of rumors that he was gay as well? Um, well, that was Louis the Thirteenth. There's a lot of rumors that Louis the Thirteenth was. But they thought, well, Louis the Sixteenth. They think they they just were too young. I mean, they were fourteen, fifteen years old. Mm -hmm. Yeah, more interested in other things. Mm -hmm. Does anybody else have a guess about the secret queen and wife of Louis the Fourteenth? This is this is kind of a tough one. I mean, there were so many mistresses. How do we keep track? But there was, there was. We always love the stories of the mistresses and the courtesans. <laughs> the courtesans are our favorite. Yes. We talk about a lot of courtesans on the podcast because, you know, they were fascinating. They, they were, were modern day women. They had their own money. They could do whatever they wanted. They were. They were doing whoever they wanted. They were. They definitely were doing that. Fancy prostitutes. Well, the secret queen and wife of Louis the Fourteenth was, oh, Carol has got it. Madame de Maintenon. It was Madame de Maintenon. Um, she came to first uh, to court first as the uh, unofficial governess of uh, the illegitimate children of Louis the Fourteenth and Madame de Montespan. Um, because they were Ill illegitimate, she wasn't given a title of governess or anything like that. And they basically rented a house. Uh, they bought a house in Paris, and she kind of hid away, taking care of the children because they were illegitimate. They couldn't really be seen at court. Um, but over time. Um, she actually convinced them to legitimize the children. And once they did that, she was ended up being the governess. And so she could kind of be seen at court a little bit more. Um, Madame de Mantis, uh, Montespan, who was the mother of the children, when she got involved in the affair, uh, the poisons, which we cover in the, um, in the podcast in a lot of unfortunate, gruesome detail. <laughs> She um, once that happened and she got sent from court, um, basically Maintenant was able to kind of move into the into the spot of headmistress. She was extremely devout um, Catholic. She um, I, Louis kind of thought that there was a way that by being with her, he would help pave his way, you know, and forgive his sins and um, pave his way to heaven. So they ended up actually after the queen died in 1683, a few short months after that, they ended up getting married. And uh, he, they ended up, uh, it was, she could be, she couldn't ever be called queen and she couldn't really ever be like publicly recognized, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but he loved her. Yes. Corolla has a question. She said, did, did Louis the 13th have mistresses if he was gay? Do we know well, that? There was quite a few that were said to be uh, mistresses. It's it's not a usually a... Um, the fact that most people, a lot of people think, a lot of historians think he was gay is not usually kind of at the top of his, you know, short biography. Um, but he, you know, he was the one who actually built the beginning of Versailles, the the small part of it in the very center of what they call the envelope now. He um, would go out there and he would go out there with all of his hunting buddies and no women were allowed. Mm -hmm. So it kind of, I, th I think there's just a lot of things like that added to the rumors that he was actually gay. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. We'll never know. We'll never know. All right, guys. Good guesses. Next question. Which marriage was orchestrated and planned by Catherine de Medici and Jean de Albre? Am I saying that right, Catherine? Yeah, I kind of already alluded to this one. <laughs> As they usually do. <laughs> and Jean de Albre. This marriage was orchestrated by the two of them. It was a queen, I'm assuming. Yeah. Yes, Clement. Catherine the Queen. 
Catherine the Queen de Medici and Jean de Albret decided on this marriage. So, I mean, normally, was it the women who were deciding or was it the kings? It's usually the kings, but at this point, um, Henry II, the wife of uh, Catherine, um, had died. And then she had her three sons that sh very short succession ended up being on the throne. And she was serving as regent because they were all a little younger. So the only chance that these queens got to do anything with authority was when their husbands died. Yeah, when they were as regent. Yeah, until their sons got old enough, basically. Mm -hmm. Not a bad guess, Carola. Anybody else have a guess about which marriage was orchestrated and planned by Catherine de Medici and Jean de Albre? If you don't know, no problem. Cath Claudine's about to tell you. I'm going to start calling you Catherine Claudine. I like it. <laughs> so, uh, Coretta says Marie de Medici. Not a bad guess. In the same family, Coretta. Medici, but another Medici. They were distant cousins. Distant cousins. Those Medicis, man, they have a lot of history. They de definitely do. So the marriage that was orchestrated by Catherine Medici and Jean de Albret was actually a Marguerite de Valois, Valois to Henry III of Navarre. Yeah, so seeing uh, seeing that the end of the Valois, um, the line was going to be ending because all of the children of Henry II the, that ended up being king, they were dying and they were also very young. So they didn't have any heirs. And so they were pretty worried about what was going to happen. So Catherine decided to um, orchestrate and say that her daughter, Marguerite de Valois, would marry Henry III of Navarre, who was the at that time, he his um, mother, who we had just talked about a little bit ago, was the one that ended up getting poisoned. Um, but he would end up becoming Henry the Fourth, and so she promised uh, she promised that he wouldn't she wouldn't ever um, convert Henry to be a Protestant, and that the wedding had to take place on August eighteenth, fifteen seventy two. And of course, Jean would die in June. She'd get be poisoned. And so the wedding would happen. And then a few days later after that, the St. Bartholomew Day Massacre began where the uh, many of the Protestants that were in Paris at the time, specifically for the wedding, the most prominent ones, because Jean was the head of the Protestant uh, movement, were brutally killed and the Seine ran red with blood. So much violence. I talk about all the time how Paris has to be super haunted. A lot yeah. of bad things happen here. A lot of bad things happen. <laughs> the French don't really believe in ghosts, but uh, we're the Anglo-Saxons. I'm like, the ghosts are here. Scary yeah. stuff. <laughs> Good guesses, guys. All right. Next question. Which empress, against her husband's wishes, supported women artists and writers? So she was an empress. Her husband did not want her to support people, but she was very supportive of female artists and writers. Any ideas of which empress was supporting women in the arts and in writing? Do we have any clues, Claudine? Hmm, it, well, there's only three empresses. Only three. What's the difference between a queen and empresses? What well, because they were well, the emperors, because it was different. You know, the Napoleon, Napoleon, and then Napoleon the Third. Napoleon basically named himself as emperor, and so did Napoleon the Third. Yeah, because we got rid of the kings with that whole revolution yeah. thing. So it's either Josephine or Eugenie or uh, Marie Louise. So who do we think was the empress? who was supporting female artists and writers, Josephine, Eugenie, or what was the last one, Claudia? Uh, Mary Louise. Mary Louise. These are all fun names. Maureen says Josephine. Does anyone else have a guess? Not a bad guess. Josephine was very famous. Did Josephine and Napoleon get along? I don't think they really. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. They loved it. like. It was his, uh, his last words were apparently Josephine. Mm. Yeah. I just remember that he had her painted into that famous painting with his mother there. His mother was painted in. His mother was crown. painted in. Yeah. Yeah. Cause the Which mother we might talk in the next live stream. We'll ask everybody what they think. 
Okay, so Josephine, Cheryl said, wasn't Eugenie connected to Rosa Bonner? Cheryl's so good. Cheryl's so smart. Credit mm -hmm. says Josephine. The correct answer is actually Eugenie. Yeah, so Eugenie, um, she was a wife of Napoleon III, um, but she was a huge supporter of women, including um, Rosa Bonheur, which we're going to do an, an episode about, her, just about Rosa, she's a fascinating woman. Um, but she um, was really trying to champion women's rights. She actually got it so that when the girls could take the baccalaureate because at the time they couldn't. Um, she tried to get Georges Sand into the Alliance Francaise, but that didn't really work out. Um, but for Eugenie, for Eugenie, she ended up getting the Legion of Honor Award for um, Rosa, but uh, Napoleon refused to let there be a ceremony and he would not attend it. So Rosa actually went out to her Chateau de Ville and actually gave it, awarded it to her at the Chateau. Mm, that's so sweet. She was a supporter way before anybody else was a supporter. Yes. All right, guys. Good guesses. Next question. Which queen arrived at her wedding and her dress was a few sizes too small? Can you imagine arriving to your wedding and your dress does not fit? I mean, how was that working? Didn't they do sizings? Like what? What was this? No, because she was in another country up until the day before the wedding. Oh, the day before the wedding. So they just kind of guessed on the size and they're like, here you go. Yep. So this queen arrived and her wedding dress was a few sizes too small. Which queen do you guys think it was? And we talked about this queen on the podcast already. We actually had a multi-segment show on her because there was so much to talk about. With so this. much. So much, so much. And we talk about this in the podcast as well as they had to kind of like clip her into her dress. So well, cool. it was uh, laced. I mean, they laced it up. So it was uh, laced up with all the undergarments, under under pieces, you know, basically showing. Oh, her undergarment. Handle. Not very queen-like. Mm -hmm. Yes, Carola said Marie Antoinette. And I guess they measured her a year earlier and she grew up up why would you measure somebody a year early for their wedding i mean especially at that age these were all like teenagers they hit growing spurts i'm gonna have i mean i pretty much just gave that one away it was it was marie antoinette it was marie antoinette she was actually she was measured quite a few times right up before she left but it took you know it took quite a quite a few weeks to actually get from austria and into france and maybe you know there was just you know, she brought, she was bringing those croissants with her, um, but she got there and the dress, um, she basically two hours before the wedding, she's at Versailles at the first time she arrives to Versailles, they put the dress on her and it wouldn't completely close, lace up and close. So she basically walked down the aisle with part of her undergarments being seen through the back of the bodice where the, where it laced up. That, yeah, I mean, and she was what, 14 years old? 13? Mm -hmm. It was all downhill from there. <laughs> <laughs> no happy endings there. Good no. guesses, Carola and Kathy. All right, mm -hmm. next question, guys. Another which, wedding dress. Yeah, which queen shocked everyone in a white wedding dress? So this was a queen of France, and she shocked everybody when she wore a white wedding dress. What color were they normally wearing? Um, they weren't, they weren't white. White was a color for the monarchy of mourning. So you wouldn't wear white at your wedding. Well, I mean, I guess some people might, but um, they didn't, they didn't wear white at the time. So this queen made everyone very surprised when she wore a white wedding dress to her wedding. Who do we think it was guys? Any guesses? We already mentioned her before. She's wearing a white wedding dress and everybody was shocked. Any guesses on which queen this was? Do we have pictures of that too? Are you going to show that on your website? I don't because it's so old. Mm, no it's paintings. From the, it's from the uh, 1500s. But they didn't so, do paintings of her? They've. I've only found a few like sketches, but it's mm -hmm. not really. It's more of like a big group, um, a big group shot. Mm, family. I did, I did write about it on Instagram um, on the date of when it had back in May. Mm -hmm. And I think I, I posted some of the sketches I found, but unfortunately that I think uh, it's, it sounds, the dress sounds very close to what Marie Antoinette's dress was too. 
Maya says, Victoria, good guess, Maya. The actual answer to the queen who shocked everyone by wearing a white wedding dress was Mary Stewart, Queen of Scots. It was Mary, Queen of Scots again. Um, when she stepped out of the carriage, when she arrived in uh, May 1558 and arrived at the Notre Dame du Paris, and she stepped out and everybody was aghast because she was wearing this white dress that was sewn with, um, had silver um, threads going through it. And so it was quite the shock because at the time, you know, only the monarchy wore white as, as a form of mourning. So she was wearing a white dress. The white dress didn't come become traditional until the 1800s. So she was very ahead of her time. That's crazy. I can't believe it took till the 1800s. Yeah. I know. <laughs> I was really surprised about that too. when I found that. That's great. All right, guys. Good guesses. The next question, this empress may not have produced an heir, but she was the grandmother to an emperor. <coughs> Ooh, I'm going to get some water. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so she was, she, this is an empress that ended up, she couldn't produce an heir. She was the, a very famous one, um, but she didn't have an heir to the throne, but she did end up being the grandmother of one. And she was a empress, so yes. not a queen, guys. And we haven't talked about her yet. She's going to be multi-episodes, I think. Yeah, she's like Marie Antoinette. So she couldn't have any babies, but she was a grandmother to an emperor. Who was it, guys? It's hard to guess on these. I wouldn't have known any of these. Claudine's teaching me so much. <laughs> Maureen says Josephine. Cheryl says Josephine. I like Joss. Joss. <laughs> <coughs> oh, I have a tickle okay. in my throat. Sorry, guys. Not Corona. You have to say <laughs> that. <laughs> Everyone's scared. You guys are all correct. It was Josephine. It was Josephine. She had from her very first marriage, she had um, two, she had a son and a daughter um, from Alexandra de Beauharnais. And she ended up, excuse me, she ended up having um, a daughter, Hortense, um, who married her stepfather's brother. So she married Napoleon's brother, um, Louis Bonaparte. And so in 1848, um, Louis Bonaparte had a son, Napoleon III. There you go. She still got to be a grandmother. Yes. Even if she couldn't make any babies. That, yes. She had babies. She just didn't have, you know, the rightful uh, heir to the heir to the little man's throne. <laughs> Not the right order. Good guesses, guys. This next question. Who was the last queen of France? So we're talking about like legally or? Yep, the very last one. Because technically they're still kings and queens they're just not honored well no she this was technically a queen she was the last queen there's people now um there's louis the 20th who i met um he is uh he it said that if they had a king of france now he would be the king mm. but this one was she was actually a queen and this was the last one so who was the last queen of france Yes, Edith, you got the last one, Josephine. We missed that. Good guesses. Edith is a tour guide in Paris as well, and she's a true Parisian. She was born in Belleville. You guys have to meet Edith on your next trip to Paris. And check out her new book. She's writing books in English now, even though she's a French woman. We're very proud of her. So the last queen of France, who was it, guys? Who do we think it was? I had no idea. I always thought it was like Marie Antoinette because they cut her head off and that was the end of that. But this was actually the last queen of France. Yeah, Maya, I'm with you. Marie Antoinette, Edith, I'm with you. I thought it was Marie Antoinette as well. But Claudine, who was it? It was Maria Amalia of Naples and Sicily. She was born on April 26th. Same day as me. She um, she ended up being a, um, exiled in Naples. And when she was there, she, mar she met Louis-Philippe d'Orléans, um, who was also exiled from France. And so the two of them met there. Um, she was actually the niece of Marie Antoinette. So it was kind of a little bit of a, a 
of drama because here, you know, she was so closely related to Marie Antoinette. And then she ended up marrying Louis Philippe. Um, the, they returned to Paris in 1814 and then 1830 after the July revolution, they were finally named King and Queen of France, but their reign would end in 1848, which also completely ended the monarchy. Mm. Very interesting. I had no idea of her existence. So the last King of France, Queen, the last King and Queen. Uh, <laughs> all right, guys, next question. We're almost done. You guys are some great guessers. Which queen was killed by her husband? So this was a French queen and she was killed by her husband. The only one in French history, correct? Well, who knows? I mean, you could maybe go some of those really far back there where, you know, we don't have as many details. I wouldn't be surprised if that was something that didn't happen, but mm -hmm. this is one that I found that they said that he had her killed. Mm. He wanted her, his wife murdered. So mm -hmm. much drama. I mean, I feel like this could be so many TV series. There was so much drama in French history. I mean, we all know the series Versailles, but I feel like there could be. I so know they don't do a whole lot of other ones. I mean, like the, uh, um, the, the uh, English, they have so many TV shows about all of the English monarchy. Yeah. Yeah. They, they play around with that a lot more than the mm -hmm. French. So this queen was killed by her husband. It was Marguerite de Bourgogne. Yeah, she was the youngest daughter of Louis the Ninth, who we know as Saint Louis. Um, in 1314, um, she was uh, caught in the act of adultery um, along with uh, Jean and Blanche de Bourgogne. Um, and when the men were talked to and captured, basically they said that they had this affair had been going on for years. Mm -hmm. It was in the uh, Tower of Nesso, which would be basically kind of right across um, from where the Louvre is down a little bit. Um, but it was a quite a big scandal. The men confessed. And so then she was thrown into jail. She was actually uh, became queen while she was in the jail. And they said that she died mysteriously, but they think that uh, he actually ordered her to be strangled and killed. Oh, this is so sad. They were all having affairs. I don't understand. They were all, that's very true. Yeah. <laughs> affairs. You're not a king or a queen unless you're having an affair. Oh, yeah. um, we're coming up on the last three questions, guys. We love your guesses. Keep throwing them out there. Who created a garden filled with roses and swans? This was actually an empress. So there's only three of them, guys. Who do you think created a garden? It was filled with roses and swans. I feel like this could be a lot of queens and empresses. I mean, they were all into beautiful things. Marie Antoinette, I love her little petite triomphe. Mm-hmm. But this person created a garden filled with roses and swans, and she was a empress. Who was it, guys? We've already mentioned her name. Maybe you remember. It starts with, oh, Joanne, Josephine. That's correct. It was Josephine. Yes, and you could go there. If you haven't been to Malmaison before, you definitely need to go. Check the hours because they're open like in the morning and then they close for lunch for a while, then reopen. Um, but Josephine bought Malmaison in 1799 when, uh, jo when Napoleon was away. Um, and she absolutely uh, loved flowers. She loved the more uh, English style garden than the very French rigid, you know, construction of shapes and so she um, she loved roses. So she wanted to create them um, and have every rose known in the world. So she ended up finding a nursery, the Lee and Kennedy Nursery in London. And they ended up finding all of these different roses from her for her, um, including ones from China. So she created this huge, uh, huge um garden in France in it at Malmaison. Um, it's been changed. You could go there now and you could walk around the, along the rose bushes. It's a little bit different. They've changed it since uh, she obviously was there. But um, Napoleon was also given a gift of two black swans and he didn't really, um, she didn't really want to have uh, he didn't really want them. He said, why do I have these? So he gave them to Josephine. And still to this day, I have pictures of when I last went there that there's still black swans swimming in the little tiny lake and river that they have there. That's so cool. Mm -hmm. I love it. 
There's so much like black swans are such like a special thing to see. I've only seen them. I saw them in Hawaii. Actually, I saw a black swan. Yeah. And I've seen a couple in Paris. But yeah, they're really pretty. They're beautiful. They're so uh, exotic. Good guesses, guys. I feel like everyone got that one. Josephine. All right, we're coming down to our last two questions. Let's see if you guys can get these. Which empress was greeted by a large wooden Arc de Triomphe as she arrived in Paris? So uh, there was a large wooden Arc de Triomphe greeting her as she arrived to Paris. And she was an empress once again. That means you only have three choices, guys. And what is up with this wooden Arc de Triomphe? Are they building the original one? Mm -hmm. what was it wasn't done yet. It wasn't done. So they just had a wooden. So it was just like the Arc de Triomphe covered in wood from them building. It underneath. was basically reconstructed out of wood because the builder of that, um, the emperor that wanted it built, um, it wasn't done yet. Mm, okay. He wanted to have this great triumphal arch to, to ride into the city of Paris. So which one of the empresses was greeted by a large wooden Arc de Triomphe? As she arrived in Paris, because the original Arc de Triomphe that we see today was not finished yet. Who do we think it was? You have three guesses. Eugenie, wow. Josephine, or Marie-Louise. Who do we think it was, guys? I only knew Josephine. I never really knew anything about Eugenie or Marie-Louise. Well, we're going to do one on Eugenie soon. A podcast on Eugenie. Eugenie. Edith said her nickname was Le American for Josephine. Josephine's nickname was American. Cheryl says, Marie Louise. Cheryl, you are a genius. Cheryl gets all the hard questions. Cheryl's so good. Cheryl is correct, guys. It was. It was Marie Louise. Um, Napoleon, um, after Josephine couldn't have any children and he needed to remarry, he um, remarried Marie Louise, who was the Duchesse de Parma of the Habsburg Empire. Again, we go back to uh, the line of Marie Antoinette. Um, when the wedding was planned, Napoleon wanted um, them to ride into Paris to the Tuileries underneath the Arc de Triomphe, but it had only been started um, four years before. And uh, so, you know, not a lot had been done except for basically the base of it and not, not at all what we know today. So he had an entire full size version of it created out of wood just for them to ride under. That's so wild. I would it's love so to see that. <laughs> it's like build the, I mean, I feel like building the wooden one would just be very difficult as well. I, yeah. I yeah. Love to see that. Oh, wow. Maybe that's why now when they do the uh, construction on the facades of some of the historic buildings, they create, you know, the outside of it. So it looks still like it. You know how that looks just like a building, but it's just the trompe l'oeil facade. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe because of Napoleon. Napoleon had a lot of influence. Great guesses, guys. We are on our last question. We would love to hear from all of you if you know this. Wow, because I didn't know this. <laughs> I added this one in after I did all the other questions because I was like, oh, this is so good. <laughs> so good. All right, guys. Which queen later became the saint, the patron saint of women, women with ill-tempered husbands? So she was a queen, and then she became a patron saint of women with ill-tempered husbands. <laughs> I feel like we could all be the patron saint. <laughs> Everybody could pray to saint. To I won't say her. I almost oh. said her name. <laughs> you didn't say it. You said I didn't. And I stopped myself. Okay, so this queen, this was a queen, and she long later queen a long time ago, long time ago, queen, and she became the patron saint of women with ill-tempered husbands. I would ask you which queen had an ill-tempered husband, but I would have to say all of them, I feel like. <laughs> she didn't really, though. I mean, for most of the stuff about him, he wasn't, that's not like the, the biggest thing that comes out about him. So, guys, who is the patron saint of ill-tempered husbands? She was also a queen a long, long time ago. Claudine, do we get any other any other clues? Uh, she was uh, she was very close with Saint Genevieve. So mm -hmm. this is how old this is. <laughs> it 
long time ago, guys. I'm not even sure how to say her name. I'm going to need help from Claudine. It's easy for me to say it's because uh, it used to be what spell check changed my name to all the time, which is very random. <laughs> That's so weird. Mm -hmm. Any guesses, guys? It starts with a C. She was, <laughs> she was she's the patron saint of ill-tempered husbands. Among other things. Among other things. What else did she do? She was patron saint of uh, brides and widows and those that were exiled and also those that suffered a violent death. So she suffered a violent death? No. But she became the patron saint of people. Mm -hmm. who, wow. I mean, sometimes they make sense. Like Saint Denis is one of his things is the patron saint of headaches. Well, which kind of makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, but yeah, this one is, you know, not as much. All right, guys. I'm just going to tell you it is Clotilde. Yes. Yeah, Saint Clotilde. She was a wife of Clovis, who was the king of the Franks. Um, she was a very, very devout Catholic. Um, she was friends with uh, Saint jean -Vievre. Well, but when she was just jean -Vievre. And they created the abbey of, uh, of Saint jean -Vievre that was at the top of the Mont Saint jean -Vievre that we know today, which is kind of basically where the, the Pantheon is. She There's the tower behind it, the tour, Tower of Clovis. That's really all that remains of it. But um, she, yeah, she ended up being, that's one of her things is she's the uh, patron saint of ill-tempered husbands. <laughs> but she converted Clovis. He, she tried to convert him for a long time to be Catholic and he wouldn't until he went to battle one day and he prayed to the God of uh, Clotilde and said if he survived and they, they won, they were victorious that he would convert and he did convert. Well, winning for her. <laughs> so maybe he was really grouchy about it. So that's why he's. <laughs> we all have our days. We well, do. thank you guys so much for tuning in. We had a great time chatting with you. We so appreciate you giving guesses and chatting with us. And every week you can listen to the podcast to learn more about these people, these beautiful women. Uh, every Monday, we have Paris History Epic, a Hemingway. Just look up La Vie Creative on iTunes, Spotify, anywhere you can find podcasts, La Vie Creative. You'll find us. And every Monday, we have a new episode about these wonderful ladies in French history. And if you want to support us, we've left our links in the, the caption. And we also have Patreon pages if you want more fun information direct from Paris. Thank you. Yeah, guys. And I've been, I have been doing some more videos um, for Patreon history videos just for Patreon folks. So sign up for as little as five dollars a month to check those out. Uh, tomorrow's episode is about uh, Jean Levin, who was a designer in France. She also created the oldest uh, fashion house in the world. She created and started most things um, long before the person that everybody thinks did everything, Coco Chanel. So <laughs> I love the fact that Jean Levin um, and hopefully people will get to know her and know what amazing person she is that didn't have such a horrible dark side to her like the other designer. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you so much. And tune in. in oh, another one more thing. One oh, more yes. thing. So next, the next live stream, do we want, I was going to, I was going to do it about uh, Napoleon because it's uh, a few days before the anniversary of his coronation and that amazing painting that's in the Louvre. Or uh, would it be maybe more broad and do like the kings and emperors of France? Which one do you want to see? So would you prefer Napoleon specifically or the kings of France, the kings and emperors? The kings and emperors, yeah. You know, equal rights and all that. What do mm -hmm. you guys prefer? You want to learn just about Napoleon or trivia about the kings and emperors of France? You guys are a smart group, I feel like. Mm -hmm. you know, they can handle either way, but we love hearing back from you. So, oh, Catherine says kings, Napoleon. Well, if you're tuning in later, you can also leave a comment. We will tally up and decide. Girl, this is kings and emperors. Yes, David did such wonderful work. Napoleon. Cheryl says, I don't know. This is tough. Napoleon. <laughs> well, if we do kings and emperors, you will get Napoleon as well. That's but true. Napoleon, there's a lot of history. 
There is. It's always a quiz, Corolla. So we always do trivia with you guys. Pick the things you're good at or the things you want to learn about. But just feel free to leave a comment on which one you prefer, just Napoleon or the Kings and Emperors. And we will see you guys in another two weeks. Thank you we'll so see much. You then. See Thank you. you. Bye.